going if uh, f and g are measurable then the set of x's for which f of x is equal to g of x is a measurable set was this part of a homework I'm sorry we did it in class Anyway, let's, let's go over this because it's, uh, it's important and we'll need it. Uh, so what we do is transform this into this problem, which is the same as f minus g minus 1 of the set 0. Okay? So you need to understand this notation. We are not assuming that the inverse function exists. It's a notation which is valid for any function and which tells us that we are looking for all the x's so that f minus g x is equal to 0. Okay? This is the inverse image of a set 0, not of 0. It's a, it's a minor point, but because we don't know that we have an inverse function, we wouldn't be able to do of zero without the braces. When I put braces, it means that I'm doing a set. So this is equal to that. I'm looking at this inverse image. And now zero is, for instance, the intersection of minus 1 over n, 1 over n. Why? Well, one inclusion is clear. Zero is always in these guys, so it must be uh, in the intersection. For the other inclusion, you take an x in your intersection for every n. So it means that x is always between minus 1 over n and 1 over n. You let n go to infinity, and you end up with 0 less than zero. So the only possibility is x equals zero, which tells you that x is zero. So you have like this the double inclusion. One is clear, the other one you need to do something about, and uh, so you get this equality. Okay? So this shows that uh, zero is a Borel set. There are 100 other ways to see that. Okay? You could take the complement of 0, and that would be minus infinity 0 union 0 positive infinity, which is also a Borel set, be because it's an open set. Okay? Because this is actually a closed set. Okay, in any case, because we're assuming that f minus, minus g, so f minus g is Borel measurable, then we get f minus g minus 1 of 0 to be also over our set. And we are done. We didn't prove that f minus g was Borel? Uh, you are right. However, if you do uh, if you take your f measurable and you multiply by any constant c, then it's easy to see that cf is also measurable because uh, it's just a question of right. You could just say that you have a product of two measurable functions. And therefore, minus f is measurable, and the addition of f and uh, minus g is therefore measurable. More questions on this uh, problem? Okay, so we need this to do the following one, which is number three. 
uh, in the book, page 48, we, where you look at the limit of Fn of x. So you look at the convergence set of your sequence Fn. So you look at all the axes so that limit of Fn of x exists. And you want to show that this is, again, a measurable set, provided your sequence Fn is also measurable. Now, the, the crucial remark is the following. The limit exists if the limb inf is equal to the limb sub. That's the only way your limit must exist. Okay, it's a, it's a necessary and sufficient condition. Yeah. Uh, the the problem may look complicated because you have a sequence of functions, but it's actually once you look at this, you have a sequence of numbers. Okay, because we're talking pointwise convergence here, and therefore you're looking at the limb inf of a sequence equal to the limb sub of a sequence. That's all you're doing. Now, this function, this is a well-defined function that we can call g, and this function we can call it h. And we have seen that they are both measurable. Okay, that's one of the things we did last time, that g and h are measurable if uh, you start with a measurable sequence, uh, a sequence of measurable functions, rather. And so we are back to the problem we had before. We are back at x equal, uh, we are looking for the axis for which g of x is equal to h of x, where g and h are measurable. Okay, so we are exactly in that situation, and we can conclude that, so this set is measurable. And all along, we are talking about Borel measurable, okay? Because uh, in, in our argument, it's crucial that we know that this thing is a Borel set, and therefore, the inverse image of a Borel set is a Borel set. If we are talking about some other type of sigma algebra, we may be out uh, of, uh, you know, measurability. So when you say just Yes, when there is no precision, when there, there is no mention of sigma algebra or anything, you assume it's a Borel sigma algebra. But it's better to be precise in these things, in particular in these uh, uh, measurability problems. And most of the time, you see, we'll be dealing with integrals, it will be obvious what we mean. But in, in this case, uh, it's not. Okay, so the next one was number four. And so, uh, the a very important uh, uh, result is that uh, in order to show that uh, my function f is measurable, it's enough to check that f minus 1 of uh, intervals of a certain type are measurable. Okay? Because, so this is the thing we will be, we'll keep using, so let me remind you of this. Number four, we have f 
okay, so so the, the usual the usual setting will be something like this. Okay, we have a function that goes from some set X with a sigma algebra A into R with a Borel sigma algebra. Well, it turns out that um, F is Borel sigma, is uh, Borel measurable. If and only if F minus 1 of, uh, let's say, A positive infinity belongs to B, uh, belongs to A for every A in R. Okay, normally I, I would need to check every Borel set and I would need to check that F minus 1 of B belongs to A for every Borel set. But we proved that it's enough to check for something generating your Borel set. Now we know that uh, A positive infinity open like this is one possibility. We could close it. We could look at minus infinity A. We could close it as well. So there are many possibilities. Okay, this is just one uh, set of uh, sets that uh, generate your Borel sigma algebra. Okay, so now we are trying in problem four, we are trying to be even more restrict restrictive. We are trying to look at Instead of uh, sets of the type minus infinity A, we are looking now at, well, or A positive infinity, we are looking at sets of the type R positive infinity, where R is a rational. Okay, so that's, uh, that's a smaller set than this one. And the question is, is it enough? And basically the question is, can I generate overall sets by only looking at integrals of this type? And the answer is yes, because the rationals are dense in the reals. Okay? So one, one way to, to formulate this, let's see what did I write here, is that, okay, because of the density, because of the density of the rationals, I can find a sequence uh, Rn in the rationals such that Rn is between A minus 1 over N and A for every N. Which, okay, because these, uh, I can always find a rational between two real numbers. And therefore, of course, Rn is converging to A. Because there is always a sequence of uh, rationals, you can always find a, a, a sequence of rationals converging to any, to any real. And now if I look at my intersection of Rn positive infinity, I actually get A positive infinity. So let's check that. Well, uh, you see that Rn positive infinity is bigger. You see that A positive infinity is always included in Rn positive infinity. Because Rn is bigger than, uh, is smaller than A. So this interval is bigger than this one. Okay, you're just uh, enlarging your interval by something. Therefore, this is included in that, which means that it's also included in the intersection of all these guys. So we have one inclusion. For the other inclusion, you take, as always, x in your intersection. Which means that your x is bigger than Rn for every n. You pass to the limit. And you get that x is bigger than or equal to a, which means that x belongs to a positive infinity. So we have a double inclusion, which means that uh, 
which means what? Well, it, it means in particular that uh, this, uh, uh, when, when we're doing, okay, so when we're doing f minus 1 of a positive infinity, we get f minus 1 of the intersection of the Rn positive infinity, which is also the intersection of all n of f minus 1 Rn positive infinity. Okay, because f minus 1 commutes with union and intersections. But this, by a hypothesis, belongs to, uh, to the sigma algebra. Therefore, the intersection of all ends must belong to the sigma algebra as well. And that proves that f is measurable. OK, because we have shown that the inverse image of intervals of the type A positive infinity is always in the sigma algebra. That's all we need. Okay. There is nothing, uh, we haven't used any property of the rationals except that the rationals are dense in variables. So uh, I could ask you exactly the same question with, uh, instead of, uh, or instead of being in the rationals, to take it in the irrationals, because the irrationals are also dense in variables. And would, that would work as well. OK? Any dense uh, set is going to work. Okay, number eight. So we have a monotone function, and we'd like to show that it's a Borel, that, um, that every monotone function is Borel measurable. So for number eight, uh, so we have f from r to r. And let's assume that f is increasing. Okay, we, can, we can adapt the argument if f is decreasing. And the first thing I'm going to prove is that if i is an interval of r, then so is f minus 1 of i. Okay, the inverse image of an interval is an interval by a monotone function. And that's very easy. Let's take x and y in f minus 1 of i. That, by definition, means that f of x belongs to i and f of y belongs to y. Now, let, let's take z between x and y. Because f is, in, is an increasing function, we have f of x less than f of z less than f of y. <coughs> so, f of z is between f of x and f of y. But these two guys are in i. And i, we know, is an interval. OK, that's our assumption. 
So f of z must be in i as well, because that's the definition of an interval. If I have anything in between two elements, it's also in my, in my set. Should I write this property or is that clear? Okay, this is what it means to be an interval. You take any two elements, and if you take something in between, it's also in your interval. So f of z is between these two. Therefore, f of z must belong to i, which means that z must belong to f minus 1 of i. So we took someone in between two elements of f minus 1 of i, and we have shown that it's also in f minus 1 of i. Therefore, f minus 1 of i is an interval. So now it's very easy because what I do is I take, for instance, f minus 1 of minus infinity a is an interval. For every a, because this is always an interval. So it is a Borel set because every interval is a Borel set. Therefore, f is measurable. And here is something that we, uh, I, I probably have mentioned that, but maybe not, I haven't proved it, which is that why is this overall set? Well, it's because it's a set of a type minus infinity A, A, B, B positive infinity, closed or open at the boundary. Okay? So there are two, two things here going on. You give yourself a definition of an interval, the one we are using, and then you show that the only sets that verify the definition are the usual, uh, the, the, the usual sets known as interval. OK, do you see that there are two things going on here? And this is rarely done. I did do it in my analysis book. But would you say this is rarely done? It's not done usually. I mean, many times uh, uh, it's very vague what we are talking about. I mean, there are two definitions many times, but it's, many times it's not shown that the two definitions are the same thing. That's, uh, anyway, so that's how, that's one way to show that a monoton function is measurable. That's not the only way. What, what do you know about monoton functions and continuity? Of course, there are monoton, monoton functions do not need to be continuous. So that's, that's pretty clear. You jump here, this is monoton, it's not continuous. But do you know something about the set of discontinuities of monoton functions? It's countable, exactly. It's at most countable. Okay, and that's because a monoton function at every point has a limit to the left and a limit to the right. And that allows you to count them. That's, it's not very difficult to prove. But, uh, so what we have here is a function which is continuous almost everywhere. And therefore, it's a Borel function because of it. So if you knew this fact, you didn't need to do any work. But that's an interesting result, because uh, we, we add our uh, set of measurable functions now with monoton functions, which Oh, then there was uh, uh, the additional problem that I had asked you to look at.
So let's give ourselves some. So we have this here. Three, two. Okay, so let's let's give us this function. And we'd like to show that this function is uh, Borel measure. Again, we could, if, if we know this fact that um, a function which is almost uh, everywhere equal to another function which is measurable is measurable, we are done. Because this is a continuous function, this is continuous almost everywhere. Because it's discontinuous at one point, and that's it. But we haven't proved that fact yet. So for the time being, uh, let's let's do direct proof. Well, what we can do here is look at f minus one of minus infinity a for every a, because it's a very simple function. And so, if we take our a to be, if we take our a to be less than one or equal to one, it means that. We are looking at the inverse image of something strictly less than one. Okay, so we want to know if there are x's that come on this interval below one. Well, there are none. So we we have that this is the empty set if our a is less than one. Well, it's strict here, so I can take it equal to. Because if a is 1, I'm looking at minus infinity 1 excluded. That's why. Then I look at what's going on between 1 and 2. So let's, let's look now at a minus infinity a. My a is somewhere here. So now I'm taking a strictly bigger than 1 and less than or equal to 2. Well, how can I get to uh, some point here, it means that I, I must get to 1. That's all. That's the only point I can reach. And the point I can reach is uh, all the x's that are between 0, 3, union 3, positive infinity are going to work. Okay? See what I'm saying? That if I'm looking at this interval here, The actual range is just 1. And in order to get 1, I can use any x between 0 and 3, any x between 3 and positive infinity. I cannot use 3, because if I use 3, I jump to 2. And that's not good. That's outside my, my interval. So we have this guy here, which is fairly nice, union of two open intervals. And finally, if my a is strictly bigger than 2, then I'm up here. And clearly, then, I, I can use all the x's. Because f of x is always less than 2. So if a is bigger than 2, f minus 1 of minus infinity a is uh, 0 positive infinity. So in the three possible cases, you see that I always get Borel sets. Okay, this is Borel, this is a Borel set, and that is a Borel set. So F is Borel measurable. Questions? Okay, so that's a direct proof. But also, I, I like this proof because it, it really tells you how useful this uh, fact is. That you, you, the only thing you need to look at is minus infinity a. That's all. And if we were a little more brave, then we could think about a function with 
countable discontinuities. And then we could order our discontinuities or count them because they are countable and do what we have been doing uh, for that. Okay, we are, we are going to get uh, a union of uh, intervals every time. Okay, so this method could be applied to more general functions. The notation is what kills us. Uh, in this type of thing, I mean, you, you need to, to write things up, which is not so easy. But that's, that's the idea. That's all for homework. Okay, um, what I'm going to do now is, so still in 2.1, I'm going to talk about uh, simple functions. So this is still 2.1. And so we say that the function phi is simple if phi can be written as a sum like this, where so the AIs are positive numbers. Uh, These are measurable sets. And what this means, the definition of one AI of X is one if X belongs to AI and zero otherwise. Yeah. Uh, Fallon uses the notation key. Okay, I, I'm going to use this notation one a, but uh, you you can also use this notation key a. Okay, this is the same thing as one a. <coughs> so it's a zero one function. Either yeah, if it if the point belongs to the set, it's one. If not, zero. Okay, uh, and then yeah, uh, it's so we will use the so-called standard representation, which means that um, uh, the AI are disjoint and. Uh, the union of the AIs is the whole X. Uh, what's very important is that we are talking about a finite sum. Okay, we we just uh, uh, have finite union. So, for instance, if our AIs are simply intervals, we would have a step function. Okay, we could have something like this. Okay, assume that you have three intervals. This is your A1, 
this is a2, this is a3, and then this, of course, corresponds to a1. So you would have, well, doesn't really work, does it? Uh, well, then, okay. So if this is a1, what happens? No, that's okay. That's a2, and this is a3. They are disjoint, so that's okay. Of course, our A's are not going to be intervals in general. They are going to be horrible. Okay? They are going to intermix with each other, so we are going to have points going up and down everywhere. But, uh, yeah, they, they could right, be disjoint and, and still you know, overlap. But, but they, they need to be disjoint. Okay, so... Uh, in particular, if we are talking about this, uh, this standard uh, representation, what's going to happen is that your AI may very well be zero, but you still need to think about it. Okay, so it's going to be zero times something. Like in this example here, uh, we could have that this is a four you know, the, the rest of the half line, and our A4 will be zero. Okay, so maybe I should give us numbers here. Two, this is one, this is five, and so what, what I'm saying here is that we have that phi in this case would be uh, two A, one A1, plus 1A2 plus 5, 1A3 plus 0, 1A4. Okay, that's the type of, uh, of thing uh, we are thinking about. So that's what a simple function is. Now, the crucial importance of uh, simple functions is that any measurable function is a limit of simple functions. That's, uh, that's a very important result that we'll use over and over. Questions on simple functions? Assume that f, so our setting is going to be x a into r b. And actually, we're going to look at positive functions, positive or zero. Then uh, there exists a sequence of simple functions. that I can call uh, zero if you want. They are, all, they are always positive, uh, simple functions as well. So, and they are going to be, it's going to be an increasing sequence such that phi n of x converges to f of x for every x. Okay, so this is pointwise convergence. Okay, you fix an x, and then you take the limit. As n goes to infinity. So that's going to be extremely useful because simple functions are simple to deal with. I mean, they're just this uh, combination of uh, indicators. And then you have this convergence theorem that allows you to pass to the limit. Okay, so, so it's really going to be a crucial tool for us. Okay, so how do you prove that?
Okay, so we do a following. Uh, okay, so let's let's take a t positive or zero. And let's fix n. Then I claim that uh, there exists a k, and the k is going to depend on t and on n, such that uh, t is squeezed between k 2 minus n and k plus 1 to minus n. Okay, uh, graphically, what we're doing is slicing our half line in uh, graduations worth 2 to the minus n. And we're saying that t is somewhere in between. And it's pretty obvious that such a k must exist, right? Uh, another way to look at this is to say that I'm looking at t divided by 2 to the minus n. And I'm trying to find an integer. Uh, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to show that t over 2 to the minus n is between k and k plus 1. OK? So you could. And, what you could say is, by the Archimedean property, you know there is a natural bigger than t over t 2 to the minus n. But then you take the smallest one of, of uh, the k, and you subtract 1. And that's going to give you a lower bound, and your upper bound is given by the, the, the natural plus 1. OK, in any case, uh, that's, uh, that shouldn't be a, a problem to, to believe. I'm not going to do a formal proof, but it's, it's fairly easy by using the, the well-ordering principle. That's all you need to use, and uh, the Archimedean property. OK, so our t is uh, in between these two guys. That's the first step. And then uh, we define the function. So I'm going to call this thing c. Define Cn of t. As being k two to the minus n if uh, okay if t is between zero and n and c n of t equal to n if Uh, t is bigger than it. So you 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 have an unfixed. You pick any t you want which is positive. There are two possibilities. Either your t is between zero and n. Or it's bigger than n. If it's bigger than n, you say Cn of t is n, and you're n. If it's smaller than n, you go here and you say, I know I have a k corresponding to my t, such that this happens. That's the k I'm using. Okay, that's the k I'm using. The k depends on t and on n. Okay, it's a natural, but it depends on my t and my n. Now, uh, why is Cn measurable? Why is this a measurable function? Uh, 
where we could write our Cn as being a sum of uh, things like this, k 2 to the minus n, k plus 1, 2 to the minus n, times whatever it's, it's, it's equal to k 2 to the minus n, plus n t, or, well, uh, indicator of n positive infinity. And my k goes from 1 to uh, 2n minus 1. No, uh, to n minus one. I need something else. I need my. I need to end up at n here. So I need k plus one, two to the minus n equal to n. So my k is n two n minus one. That's what. It Because that's the definition, right? Uh, if my t is in between these two guys, then the value of a function is k2 to the minus n. If my t is bigger than n, then my value is n, and all these values here are 0. All these are disjoint. <coughs> so this is really what, with the thing I drew. And it's really a step function now. Okay, you have your little intervals, and you have different values for every every interval. So this is definitely uh, a Borel function. This, this is definitely a, a simple function. Okay? Cn is a simple function. Because all these guys are simple intervals, and uh, that's all you need. Okay, so we have a first, so we have this. Now, what we need to show is that uh, Cn of t, so what we have here is, when we do, so what do I want to do? Uh, t minus, yeah. So from this equality here, From this double inequality, we get that t minus uh, k2 minus n is between 0 and 2 minus n. But this is exactly t minus Cn of t. Okay, that's how we defined our Cn of t, uh, provided our, our t is less than n. And what this shows is that if t is less than n, then t minus Cn of t, well, uh, let's see. I shouldn't write this like this. So uh, what do I, what would I, OK, so we have this. Uh, but in order to write that, I need my t to be between 0 and n. OK, so if t is finite, then there is an n such that t is less than n. Then, if t is less than n, there exists a k such that this thing happens. t minus k, 2 minus n, between 0 and 2 to the minus n. There, is, there exists a k uh, less than n to n 
n 2n minus 1 so that this happens. So we get 0 t minus psi n of t less than 2 to the minus n. And now we can let n go to infinity. And we are going to get that psi n of t converges to t. OK, because our definition of psi n of t is this thing. That's all. Okay, we're just uh, uh, replacing this by Cn of t. Uh, the other thing we need for Cn, we also, well, one thing that we, we see here is that t is bigger than Cn of t. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing we'd like to show is that, oh, yeah, if your t is infinity, because that's, that's going to happen, then what happens is that cn, so t is bigger than n for every n. Therefore, cn of t is n for every n. And cn of t goes to positive infinity. That turns out to be t. So we still have uh, the some convergence of Cn of t to t. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, now we n we'd like to compare Cn plus 1 to Cn. Uh, so what we do is, so what do we have? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we need to write the following. Uh, we know that our t is between a k, a k and t, 2 to the minus n, and uh, k and t plus 1, 2 to the minus n. Now, we could do exactly the same thing for 2 to the n minus plus 1. So we would have k n plus 1 t, 2 n minus n minus 1, less than k n plus 1 t plus 1, 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. OK, we can, we can do the same bounds with 2 n minus 1. 2 minus 1 minus n, minus 1 instead of 2 to the minus n. Uh, how do we compare these two bounds? Well, what we can do is multiply uh, what, what, yeah, if I multiply across by 2 here, no, that's not what I want to do. Okay, what, uh, what I can write here is that this is really, So I can change this double inequality by putting a 2 here and a plus 1 here. And a 2 here and a plus 1 here. OK, so I have multiplied and divided by 2. That's all I'm doing, here and here. And then uh, we can. Uh, we, we can say the following. Uh, what do I want to? Yeah. Yeah, this is. Uh, so if I, if I look at these two things, what do I have? t over 2 to a minus n plus 1 
is in between uh, 2k and t and 2k and t plus 1. I'm taking this double inequality and dividing across by this guy. And then I do this here too, and I see that I have t over 2 minus n minus 1 in between k n plus 1 t and k n plus 1 t plus 1. Now, I have these two same numbers. In this case, they are between two consecutive in, uh, naturals, because this guy is this one plus one. So these are two consecutive. These are also two naturals, but they are not consecutive. So I can uh, claim that my uh, k n plus 1 t is bigger than my 2 k n t. Do we agree on that? You see, it's what I'm saying here is that I have t between 2 and 3, let's say. OK? And then I have t between two other naturals. But the two other naturals cannot, they must be somewhere in here. The lower bound must be lower, and the upper bound must be upper. Because there is only one way, I mean, to have two consecutive uh, naturals, and this is the way. So we could go back to, the, to a formal definition of this, but it's going to be uh, cumbersome. Uh, and I think it's, it's not going to be clearer. So it's just a question of understanding what the argument is here, that we have uh, two natural bounds, and they, they need to be on, in this order. So we have this uh, inequality between the two, which uh, tells us what? Well, remember that uh, uh, Cn of t is k and t 2 to the minus n. And C n plus 1 t is k n plus 1 t 2 to the minus n plus 1. And what we claim here is that this guy is bigger than 2 times k n t. And that's exactly C and T. So C and plus 1 T is bigger than C and T, which hopefully is what we wanted. Yes, we wanted an increasing sequence. Okay. So at this point, what do we have? We have constructed a, a sequence C n such that this is increasing and it increases to t. And the psi n are simple. So now we're almost done. Now we can define phi. it goes and converges to t.
So now to define phi n, we do the following. Uh, we define Cn composed with F. And maybe we need a little uh, right. Uh, what what's this thing looking like? So uh, this is a simple function, and I'm composing it with a measurable function. And so let me. Okay, in order to see what's going on. Uh, if we compose 1a and f, what do we get? I claim that we get 1 f minus 1 of a. Let's check. If I do 1a of f, this is 1a f of x. And we have two possibilities. This is 0 if f of x does not belong to a, and is 1 if f of x belongs to a. Right? Therefore, an f of x uh, belongs to a is the same as saying x belongs to f minus 1 of a. So you see that the set that counts now is f minus 1 of a. And so I'm still with an indicator. That's why I claim that phi n is simple. OK, you still get a simple function. Because you are composing, and what's going to happen is that, well, you, you have your linear combination of indicators, and every one of them is going to be f minus 1 of what it was. You still get a simple function because f is measurable, so this thing is still measurable. Am I going too fast here? Should I, should I write what I just said? Yeah. So what I'm saying is that if you take a simple function, which is going to be uh, something like this, and you compose with f, then uh, this is this which is this and therefore this is still simple of course it's crucial that your composition is from left to right if you do uh, the other, if you do f composed with a simple function, you don't get something simple. Okay, it's uh, going to mess up the whole thing. So, phi n is simple. What else? Uh, we, uh, if we do cn, if we do phi n plus one of t, we get cn of cn plus one of f of t, which is bigger than cn of f of t, and that turns out to be phi n. So that's also good. We have that our function phi n is increasing, our sequence is increasing. And finally, when we do phi n of t, 
which is f of cn of f of t, this thing converges to f of t as n goes to infinity because we say that cn of whatever converges to whatever I have inside here. So this is clear too. So we have achieved our program of finding a sequence of simple functions. Yeah, maybe uh, <laughs> in, in the book he, he does the picture rather than the proof. Maybe it's wiser. So you, you know what, what you are doing is really slicing the range. And it's, it's very interesting, actually, because uh, if you remember your Riemann integral, you slice the domain. And here we are slicing the range. Okay, and the result is quite different. So page 47. OK, maybe 10 minutes uh, break.